everybody this is Ashley with Ashley Says So I am back with another video this video is going to be about the legendary Mr. Richard Pryor two things before we start I am going to start doing intros again for the people that I can do it for as long as I don't get a copyright strike and the second thing is, is people have been asking if I make my own shirts no I do not you can get these shirts too from your local Walmart so I'm gonna just keep it real. The disclaimer for this video is going to be in my pinned top comment. So let's go ahead and get to the story, Mr. Richard Pryor. Richard Franklin Lennox Thomas Pryor was born December 1st, 1940 in Peoria, Illinois. His mother, Gertrude Thomas, was a prostitute and his father, Leroy Buck Carter Pryor, was a former boxer, but was now a pimp and a hustler. People like to think, and some sources say, that Richard's father was like his mother's pimp, so their relationship was not really a real relationship where they were in love. But I found something on the internet that seems like maybe they were married, unless this is another couple with the same exact name. But look at what I'm putting up. Apparently they were married, so their relationship had to have some sort of substance. Whether they were married or not though, I don't believe the relationship really lasts very long and I do believe that his father not necessarily abandoned him but wasn't really present in his life like a father should have been. So therefore, Richard was raised in a brothel by his mother Gertrude and her mother, a lady by the name of Marie Carter. Being raised in a brothel, Richard saw all type of horrible things such as his mother having sex as well as other ladies performing sexual acts on all different type of men. From my research, it seems that one man in particular stuck out to Richard. This is a man that was known as the mayor. Now, I'm not sure if this guy was actually the mayor of Peoria or if that's just what they called him. Maybe one of y'all can tell me that. But whatever the case, this guy really frightened Richard. And it was because every time he came to the brothel, he would ask Marie, Richard's grandmother, if there was anybody that could spread ice cream all over his body and if she could provide him a little boy that could lick the ice cream off. And I'm sure more often than not, when he requested this service, he had his eyes on Richard. Now, I'm not sure if Richard's grandmother made him perform that and lick the ice cream off of that man. I'm just telling you the information that I found. And at this point, you may be trying to imagine the best for Richard. Like maybe his grandmother wouldn't do that to him. Maybe she took care of him. But the answer to that seems like it is no. Anytime that he behaved in a fashion that was not acceptable to her, it is said that she beat on him and talked down on him. And that was pretty much all the time. Soon Richard's mother abandoned him completely and she left him fully in the care of his grandmother and other sex workers at the brothel. Now around the age of seven, Richard was sexually assaulted by a teenage neighbor and he also was molested by a man named Bubba. Now keep that name in mind because it's gonna show back up in this story later on. And if you thought things couldn't get any worse, there's actually a terrible tale of Richard trying to escape the torments and abuse in his household. So he took his little marbles and he went down the street, probably a few blocks down, and he was attempting to integrate himself with the other boys in the neighborhood, wanted to play marbles with them. And they actually pinned him up behind a wall and they took turns raping him. So he was gang raped as well. Richard Pryor had it extremely hard during his childhood. He suffered terribly. And I tend to believe that this is the reason that he was overly sexual in his adult life. Let's get on to that. Richard is a little bit older and he joins the military and things are going well for a while. But then something happened. There's this incident. Let me tell you about it. Richard is with his platoon or squad. I don't know the correct word for it, but he was with his group of soldiers pretty much. And they were all together black and white and they were watching the imitation of life. And during one of the racially charged scenes, probably the scene where Sarah Jane was trying to pass his white and that white boy slapped her about three or four times, probably that scene, one of the white guys started laughing. And first he was giggling, you know, everybody was like, okay, cool. But then he started like laughing, like ha ha ha, like really laughing, pointing, holding his stomach, probably, I don't know, but really, really laughing. So Richard and some of the other guys got upset. So they got him up and they jumped on that guy and they beat him up real, real bad. It even got to the point where Richard pulled out a knife, baby, and started stabbing that man. And when Richard pulled out his knife, the other black soldiers pulled out their knife and they were stabbing him. But I don't know if they was maybe stabbing him with a butter knife or something. 
because the guy basically got up after they were done and he didn't really have any serious injury and he certainly didn't have anything that would be fatal to him but it may be that Richard and the other black guys just kind of wanted to send him a message. They probably didn't want to kill anybody because they probably didn't want to go to jail themselves, but they did want to make it clear that, hey, you're not going to be sitting up there laughing at black racism and stuff in front of us. So period, Pooh. let's move on. Now, after and before his time in the military, Richard had already started on his comedy shows, his comedy career, and he wanted to style himself after Bill Cosby because Bill Cosby at this time was a huge success. Black audiences loved him. White audiences loved him. I mean, basically he could do no wrong and Richard Pryor wanted that. But modeling himself after Bill Cosby was not easy because Richard was actually, came, he came from the school of hard knocks. I mean, he was born in serious poverty. He was born with all of this mess and tragedy around him. So it was really hard for him. But he did work very hard and he cleaned up his act and he kind of became a new person. You know, a new kid from a stable background. He wasn't cursing doing any of his shows. His routines basically became sparkly clean, shiny and white. I mean, shiny and bright. Cleaning up his act in this way afforded him a lot of success. He was going up, up, up making television appearances, and he finally got to the big time, which was Las Vegas. But as Richard Pryor was cleaning up his act, he was becoming more depressed and more down. He had actually started to hate himself, feeling like, why am I changing myself up for people who really don't give two freaks about me? So honey, let me tell you what he did. He waited till he got a sold out show in Vegas. He got up on that stage and the only thing he said was, what the F am I doing here? Drop the mic and walk off stage, baby. Child Richard got up there and showed all his little tail, honey. You hear me? Now, after he did show his true self and his true feelings, a lot of people thought that he was not going to make it, that he pretty much gave up his career, but that is not the truth. We know that he ended up skyrocketing. People love the real, raw Richard Pryor. So we already know all that. We are not going to get into that. Y'all know what we're here for, baby. The scandal, child. The scandal. So let's get to him. First things first, it became clear to everyone around Richard that once he got a taste of fame, he went absolutely insane. Baby, they said he started treating folks around him like real nasty, like, you know, kind of like below him, like he was some kind of diva or something. They also said he became a little whore hunty. Reportedly, one of the nasty things that Richard did soon after becoming famous is to call out one of his best friends, Mr. Paul Mooney. Let me tell y'all about this. So Richard Pryor is doing one of his famous shows, cracking his famous jokes, and one of his jokes is about Paul Mooney. And I guess around that time, Paul Mooney had booked the show or was about to appear on a show, something like that. But Richard stood on stage and basically was like, hey, the way Paul Mooney got this show is because he sucked white guys' penises to get to where he was. Now, they said that Paul Mooney actually laughed in the audience, but that he was uncomfortable with that. The gossip on the street says that he was uncomfortable with that because of one of two reasons. The first reason says that Paul was upset because even though it was a joke, Richard had not prepped him. He did not let him know that he was going to use his name in one of his jokes. That's the first reason. The second reason gossip says is that because it was true. It was true. Paul Mooney was doing what he was doing with these white men to get ahead and he was upset that Richard had the nerve to call him out. You be the judge. Here's the thing though. If you do want to believe that Paul Mooney is gay just because Richard Pryor said that, then you might as well believe that Gene Wilder was gay because Richard Pryor said that he was a flaming queen and he also said that Robin Williams was either bi or gay, one of the two. But he also said that about those two guys. So... Let's move on. Now, in or around 1977, Richard started dating the beautiful actress Pam Greer. And baby, she is still beautiful today. Anyways, they were dating. They made a nice couple. But child, y'all know Richard was too crazy for Pam. He was too out there. She could not hang with him, but she tried. Oh yeah, baby, she tried. There's a tale of her trying to please him so bad to be the woman he wanted her to be that she gave him oral sex for like an hour or more and she got locked jaw because of this. Her jaw was frozen up because of how long she was trying to perform just to keep him happy. And then there's this scandalous, scandalous tale, child, about how Richard used to put cocaine on his pee-pee so he can stay hard doing the sexual encounters that he had with Pam Greer. 
And this screwed her up later on in life. She wanted to have children and she went to a doctor and she found out that she was sterile. And they said it was because of a cocaine buildup that had messed up her uterus. But the thing that really gets me about the cocaine in the vaginal area, like shouldn't that burn? Wouldn't that burn? I mean, am I crazy? I hope she wasn't just laid there with her stuff burning up. Woo, shy. Guess how he repaid her after she done done all this for him. Guess how he repaid her, y'all? By getting married to another woman while he was still dating Pam. I ain't told her nothing. She don't know nothing. She running around talking about that's her man. And this man has married another woman right up under her nose. And the woman that came and snatched Pam's man like that was a woman by the name of Deborah McGuire. Now, to be fair to Pamela Greer, Deborah McGuire was a woman that was much more Richard Pryor's speed than Pam Greer could ever be. She was much more hip and street tough. First of all, it is said that she was a high class call girl. Um, she used to sleep with wealthy men, white, black, whatever color. So that's first of all. Now there's also gossip that says Richard Pryor used to put his hands on his women too. I don't know if he ever did that to Pam, but it is certainly said that some of his girlfriends and wives, he used to put the hands on them. When Richard Pryor tried to put the hands on Deb, child Deb would fight him back. I mean, she would give him what she had, kind of like Ike and Tina and What's Love Got To Do With It. They said Deb was squaring up on him like, what's up? What's up? It ain't finna be none of that, sir. She was so tough and so crazy that one day she pulled out a gun on Richard Pryor in front of his family. And they went on doing this crazy fighting for at least a year while they were married. Then things came to a head. That is when Deb arrived home to the home that she shared with Richard and she brought her friends with her. I don't know what happened, but when she got into the house, her and Richard Pryor started to argue. So they're fussing, fighting back and forth. And then Richard grabs a gun. So Deb runs out the house and her friend's like, hold on, sis, don't leave us in here with this crazy, what's wrong with you? So they run out the house too. So they all running and all jump in the car trying to leave. Richard Pryor chased them out that doggone house and started shooting up the car. Bow, bow, bow. But luckily he did not hit anybody. Woo. And I know all of this sounds crazy and insane and believe me, I'm sure it was, but it was because Richard Pryor had also started doing drugs. So he already had a lot of trauma in his mind from his childhood and now he's mixing drugs with it. So that is making him a very violent person. This already getting to be a lot. But let's move on. On top of Richard's relationships with women, it is also said that he had a few relationships with men. For one thing, that story that Quincy Jones put out about him and Marlon Brando is said to definitely be true by some people. They say that Richard had actually went to a house party at Marlon Brando's house, and by the end of the night, they did sleep together. True enough, they were probably both very high on drugs, but in certain circumstances, not all. But some circumstances, drugs only intensifies what the person wants to do anyway. Now, like I said before, Quincy Jones and Richard Pryor's ex-wife say that this story is true. However, Richard Pryor's children and Marlon Brando's children say that this story is false. Me, myself, I am more inclined to believe the adults that were actually there and around that time period rather than children that probably weren't even born yet, or if they were, were very, very young. And here's something else to throw into the mix. If you did believe what Richard Pryor said on stage about Paul Mooney and others, then maybe you will believe that he is bisexual, gay, whatever you want to call it, because he actually said that about himself on stage. There's a segment right here on YouTube, and I'll put the clip out, out and I'll put the link in the description box, but basically he's on stage and he's saying like, I have sucked before. Like I've done it maybe three times, but I don't let them in my mouth because I don't want to get addicted or something like that. He was saying something to that effect. But I know that he did say that he has done that before. Now, some people are like, oh, he's just joking, you know. But I myself, once again, believe that he did do these things. And child, let me tell you why. It's because of a chapter that he wrote in his autobiography. And the chapter was called Two Weeks of Being Gay. Let me read y'all a little excerpt from it. One evening, I was at the candy store club in Hollywood. I spotted her standing beside the dance floor. She told me her name was Matrasha, and she was beautiful and exotic as her name and a dead ringer for a young Josephine Baker. After a night of drinking, flirting, kissing, and dancing, 
I took Matrasha home where we did cocaine and got down to business. And that means they, the next time we were together, Matrasha forgot to do the tuck and fold. When I reached down, I discovered that she was actually a he. For some reason, I didn't care. Either I wanted to nut too badly, I was too high to object, or I was as sexually confused as Matrasha. It was probably a combination of all three reasons. Matrasha and I carried on for several weeks. We even went out to dance at the Daisy. I never kept him a secret. My best friend, for instance, knew I was effing a dude, a drop dead gorgeous one at that. I even admitted doing something different was exciting. But after two weeks of being gay, enough was enough. And I went back to my life as a horny heterosexual. A while later, my best friend delivered a message from Matrasha. He'd realized a lifelong dream and undergone a sex change operation. Now he was biologically a woman and she wanted to get back together. I passed. So honey, I mean, that's Richard's own words. Like, I mean, that's him saying that y'all can steady be in denial if you want to. Whatever you want to believe, honey, it is clear that he was a wild, wild man. Now, let me sprinkle a little sad tea off up in here because this happened around this time. Richard is performing a show. He's doing well. He blows it out the water. You know how he goes. Afterwards, he's signing autographs. So he's going through signing and asking people, you know, what's the name, what's the name? And he asks one guy and the guy says Bubba. And he looks up and it is the same man that molested him when he was a child. Can you believe the nerve of that guy? I mean, I can't believe it. Like, I wish he would have like body slammed him and stepped on his head or something. Like, you really have the audacity to come up here. Are you trying to be funny? Like, what are you doing, sir? Now, most of the scandal and tea we've talked about so far happened in the 60s and the 70s. Well, now let's move to the 80s. I've already told y'all before that Richard Pryor is on drugs really, really bad. Well, on the evening of June 9th, 1980, Richard Pryor is lounging around in his house freebasing cocaine and drinking 151 proof rum. And then something weird happens. Somewhere in the midst of doing drugs and drinking, Richard takes the alcohol, the rum, and pours it all over his body and lights a match and sets himself on fire. And then he runs out of the house, running down the street, hollering and screaming and doing this until the police showed up and actually tackled him, trying to put him out. And all of this happened while his daughter was there at the house with him. Now, when he got to the hospital, they gave him a one in three chance of survival. But luckily, he did pull through. And later on, he started to make jokes about it. But people didn't really think that was so funny. As a matter of fact, people were divided. Some people thought that he started to hallucinate because of the drugs and alcohol. And that his closer friends felt like that he was trying to commit suicide. That that was a cry for help. Now, after all of this crazy, scandalous stuff, especially the last thing that just happened... Richard's life started to quiet down and settle down, but they still said he had that nasty, diva-like, manipulative attitude. In fact, on the set of the movie Stir Crazy, in which he starred, he was demanding things like foods that they couldn't provide and exotic things that nobody else was getting. He even demanded to be flown on a helicopter from his home to the set. I mean, just like extravagant, crazy stuff that wasn't nobody getting, but he felt like he should have it. Gene Wilder said that one day while they were on set, everybody is chilling out, they're done shooting, and they're all eating watermelon. Somebody has passed around watermelon. They're all eating it. Richard, everybody, you know, just enjoying talking, having a good time. Then Gene said that two of the crew members started throwing their watermelon at each other, just like tossing it at each other, whatever. I don't know exactly what they were doing. I do know, though, that he said that a piece of watermelon landed at the feet of Richard Pryor. And baby, he left the set, wouldn't talk to nobody, you know, uh, treating it basically like it's a racist thing, which nobody could understand because they were all just sitting there talking and eating watermelon. The next day, Richard Pryor didn't show up. And he did this big old hoopla about how he's quitting show business and he understands what the significance of that watermelon meant, said that he was not going to continue the movie, blah, blah, blah. 
Anyways, he ended up returning to the set. But what happened before he returned to the set is that his lawyers got in touch with Columbia and was like, hey, if you want Richard to continue being in this film, you need to basically double his salary. And so they doubled it. So, I mean, you know, he probably did lie and manipulate, but he did it so he can get a higher salary. And honestly, I, I could harp all on him and be like, yeah, he shouldn't have done that. But they was all, everybody in Hollywood has done stuff like that. When it came to relationships and marriage, Richard Pryor had several of them. There was a girlfriend named Susan that Richard had when he was 16 years old, and she bore him a daughter, Renee Pryor, who was born on February 13th, 1957. The next lady who came along, he made his first wife. Her name was Patricia Price, and she bore him a son by the name of Richard Pryor Jr. Now, come on, let's get to a little tea with this son now, because this son is on YouTube basically saying that Paul Mooney molested him when he was a little boy. Woo! Child, I just, I don't know. Hey, I don't know. The next woman in his life was a girlfriend by the name of Maxine Anderson, and they had a daughter named Elizabeth Ann, born April 28, 1967. After Maxine, he married a lady by the name of Shelley Bonus in 1967. With Shelley, he had another daughter, Rain Pryor. And here go another little bit of tea. Rain Pryor has actually written a book about her father and being his child. And in it, she touches on his drug use. And she also touches on details like how he used to bring prostitutes home. And she could actually hear him through the wall having sexual relationships with these prostitutes. His next wife was Miss Deborah McGuire, a.k.a. Deb. You know, the one who got her car shot up. They married in 1977 and divorced in 1978. And after her, he married Jennifer Lee, who was an actress and an interior decorator. They did not have any children. And they married in 1981 and divorced in 1982 and then got remarried in 2001. And she was the actual wife that he was with at the end of his life when he died. His next marriage was to a Miss Flynn Belaine, an aspiring actress, they got married in 1986. And they had already had a child before marriage, a son named Stephen, who was born August 1st, 1984. They also had a child after they were married, a daughter named Kelsey, born in October of 1987. And this marriage is kind of weird because like two months after they got married, Richard filed for a divorce. But then he went right back up to the courthouse and withdrew the divorce. And then he went back a week later and filed for a divorce again. That's when they actually got divorced. That was the 1984 marriage. They actually got remarried in 1990. And that marriage lasted a year before they divorced, finally completely away from each other in 1991. And I know this list has been confusing, but let me confuse you a little bit more. Richard Pryor also had a child by actress Geraldine Mason, and this child's name was Franklin. And Franklin was born before Kelsey, whom he had had by his last wife. You know, so he was just, a uh, child Richard was just everywhere. Let's just say what it was. Like, he was just running in between these women. He was switching up women like men switch up fitted cats. Let's just go and put it out there, because I'm not going to explain it, because he shouldn't have been doing too much. Now, during Richard's life, he had a lot of health scares. In November of 1977, after many years of drugs and smoking, he suffered a mild heart attack and he was only 37 years old. In 1986, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And in 1990, he suffered a second heart attack while he was in Australia. After this, it was discovered that he had to have surgery so he underwent a triple heart bypass surgery in 1991. Out of all of the illnesses I just named though, it was multiple sclerosis that really, really took him down. And as he got older, of course, his motor functioning skills, they disappeared, you know? He couldn't really walk anymore. He had to use a scooter. And then finally, he couldn't even talk anymore. So he kind of lost everything towards the end. And then on December the 10th, 2005, nine days after his 65th birthday, he suffered a third heart attack. And this is the one that took his life. He was pronounced dead on that morning at 7.58 a.m. His wife had him cremated, but his ashes were not actually spread anywhere until the year of 2019. So y'all, this has been the tragic, scandalous tale of Mr. Richard Pryor. Go ahead and like, comment, share, and subscribe. And let me say this before I go. If you are requesting somebody for me to do, go look on my playlist and find that video where I have the green background 
and comment your person on that video, please. That makes it so much easier for me. If y'all can comment anybody you want to see on that video in the comments, because that is where I've mostly been checking, besides the people who have left names a long, long time ago. As a matter of fact, if you left somebody and I was down to like 100 subscribers or 1,000 subscribers and I have not done your person yet and you feel like I skipped you, I, I didn't mean to skip you. So please make a comment on that page with the green background, catch my attention and let me know, hey, Ashley, I made this comment like some months ago and you still ain't done it. Please let me know, guys, because I'm not doing it intentionally. I want to be able to hit everybody that I can hit. So please leave a comment and let me know, especially if you think that I have made a mistake and skipped over your person. Let me know. Thank you guys. You guys have a great night.